great. Well, um, and, and thank you for that question, uh, uh, Tori, and to Leslie as well. Well, I know there will be uh, questions for our second guest. When you get told you're going to interview uh, the serial award-winning founder of a games company, uh, you don't think you're going to meet Debbie Bestwick, to be quite honest with you. Uh, so so she, uh, she has broken the mould, and thank God for that. Uh, Leslie, and she's our next guest. She founded Team 17. Uh, she joined the games industry when she was 17 and, um, um, and actually has created an internationally renowned uh, studio, if you like. She finds amazing creators of games and then helps them to go global. She's our second Fireside Chat guest. Ladies and gentlemen, the founder of Team 17, Debbie Bestwick. <laughs> <coughs> Debbie, welcome. A lot to live up to, right? Then Thanks for the <laughs> intro. <laughs> <laughs> I think fresh back from fresh back from some holes as well. I yeah, I didn't get a holiday last year. Um, Sam, you did the IPO last year. I know what that takes, right? Um, so my little boy, I'm a mum, and he's ten years old. I own my son, Ty. So we've just done 10 days on a beach and done nothing but that beach. Amazing. Well, good. Well, all power to you. I'm, I'm well gel, as they say in Taui. Um, um, I was going to wonder, you said it. I was reading one of your profiles. It said, I'm not what you would call your normal CEO. And, mm. uh, you know, and you've obviously floated the business. What do, you, what do you mean when you say that? I think it was in reference. Um, it comes up quite often. Look, I know I'm not, right? There's not a lot of many people with purple hair, right, in the city. Um, those who have been involved in IPO, <coughs> you know that world, and I'm very different to what they're used to. And so I just get it out of the way, right? So let me not walk in a room and deal with them looking and thinking, mm, is she really like this? It's right. like, let's just deal with it head on. Let's get it out of the way. I am not normal, right? I am passionate about video games. I'm very quirky, and I was adamant I wasn't going to be any different when it came to doing an IPO in the same right. way when I dealt with LDC on the fundraising. Um, so just deal with it head on and let them embrace you. Right. And Love that's it. what so, happens. So it would be easy to conclude then that you said, and here I am, and I don't know how it happened, but I've stumbled into this IPO. That's not the case. An IPO was something you'd had in mm. your mind. I just wonder why. Kind of a dream, right? Um, and I was thinking about this coming down a little bit, because I get asked all the time, you're a girl, a woman in video games. I, it's my 32nd year in video games. This is super unusual. I think there's only one or two female CEOs in the entire world in video games. That's how unusual this is. Um, and why? And one was, I love video games. But secondly, I was given a lot of thought to why the IPO, yeah. you know, and why it was a dream of mine. And this is really, sounds really cheesy, but I think I was about 11 or 12 years old. And somebody gave me a book. And I think it's where it first something hit me a little bit. And it's quite, most of you probably have never even heard of this person. Um, and those of you who have, brilliant. Um, but it was Barbara Taylor Bradford. Mm. And it was the Emma Hart series. Um, this was a novel. A novel, absolutely. But it's a series of books. And I think it was first, part, the first one was like a woman of substance. And it was like, I think it was living the dream and then to be the best. Mm. And these were the books that I read between the age of 11 and 16, yeah. right? Which I really shouldn't have been doing. These are books that people in their 20s should have been mm -hmm. reading. Um, but it talked about somebody who came from very humble beginnings and she built this empire. And there's something that resonated there. Yeah. And a seed was planted in that. Yeah. Place. And so <coughs> I was equally, and I still am very protective over um, creation of IP. Right. Um, in the UK, the games industry in particular, um, a lot of people talk about how great we are as a, a, a country at creating games. What we're lousy at is keeping ownership of them. Mm. Right. Um, a lot of our big gaming IPs, things like Tomb Raider, they're Japanese owned, um, things like Grand Theft Auto is owned by American companies. And I kind of wanted to break that mold a little bit and just say to people, you know what, you can be successful and you don't have to lose ownership. Right, and on that, your way of doing that, you've created over 90 games, top mm -hmm. charts around the world, and often that journey starts by identifying yeah. a talented creator. H how have you done that? What have you learned? What do you wish you'd known about finding the best of the best? Uh, I wish I'd known what I know now 20 years ago, right? Um, what would you say to your former self? That. What would I say to my former self? Oh my God, don't party so hard in your 20s and make a little bit harder. It's <laughs> probably one of the things. It's turned out all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying, you know, I was in a, you know, the games industry is a very cool industry. And when you're 18, 19, 20, 
you know, and you've got people like PlayStation with their PlayStation parties, Sony parties and things, you know, I lived the dream there too. Do you think um, you missed some opportunities in your 20s? I don't think I had the confidence, you know, and I think, and I don't know how many women, and I'd be really interested in this one. Um, my industry is very, was very much a masculine industry. Um, I could sit there and look at back and go over a two year period, there was no other female in the room with me, mm -hmm. you know, and I genuinely was the outlier in the room when it started. I was the quiet one. Um, I didn't feel that they would listen to me. And if I did speak my mind, I was shot down. I was the only woman in that room. And so confidence for me, for me was a real, real issue. And that really didn't kick in. And I, you know, I would honestly say it probably about 10 years ago, something clicked. Uh, and on that, the clicking, if we can deconstruct it a tiny bit, was there any inflection point that you mm. remember, anything that changed? Mm. Yeah. Absolutely, and that always says. Um, my son was born, right? And um, I have two children. When my daughter was born, I took two weeks off. Any of you who've got children, don't do this, please, right? Um, that's when Worms launched, mm. right? So making one of the most popular games in the world, and you're heavily pregnant, so I get that side of it. Um, and so when I had my son, I was determined that I was going to take 10 months off. And at that point, I was only a minority shareholder. I was one of the three founders. And I told them I was taking a year out and everything was planned. And I think within two months of breaking up um, from maternity leave, they were on the phone telling me that I had to go back into work. Mm -hmm. And it was quite horrible. Yeah. Um, and so I went back in and it basically was the breaking point. This was not going to continue. Mm. We had been a lifestyle business for a, a big chunk of our time. Um, and I was like this pretty angry child, frustrated. Um, and that was the point where it was like, look, I wanna, I'm either doing a management buyout and we're going to change this business or I'm actually leaving. And, and I, I, that, I, was, that was the point where I had to step up and I had to grow up. Because I can see how that could sap someone's confidence. Yeah, so absolutely. How, why did it have the opposite effect? I care passionately, right? Um, I care passionately not just about making video games, but I care passionately about the company that I've been a part of. Um, I was only, I think when we started the company, I was 20, yeah. you know? And I, I care passionately about the people that, you know, a, a, the, a, there were three founders. One of them wanted to just go off and retire. The other one really, it was a lifestyle business. It was more about, you know, some of the cr just crazy stories. You know, I think at one point we had the most expensive car park in West Yorkshire ever, you know. <laughs> so what happens when you make a game that sells 75 million copies, right? Um, and you're all in your 20s. Yeah. So I think what it was, um, it's that responsibility factor. And I don't know how many people, you know, and this is something that I struggle a little bit in the city, um, when people say to me, you know, how did you feel after you did the IPO? Mm -hmm. And most people probably would have gone home because it's exhausting. We all know that that two week, three week period and the hours that you put in. Yeah. I loved your story, six months. I mean, scarily, I did it in 91 days, right? Seven days a week. That's how hard this was. Um, but I went home and I can remember standing in my back garden and I was looking at the trees out the back because I like, I need my trees. I need my sanctuary when madness happens. And I just felt this overbearing burden at one point and it was responsibility, mm. right? And it was similar to when I did a management buyout. I was responsible for all of these people and now I was responsible not only for all these people but these amazing investors have put their complete trust and faith in me to deliver something. And although in your garden at that moment it's overwhelming. Yeah, completely. To what extent does that post-IPO moment come with additional, to use a gaming analogy, superpowers? <coughs> does it enable you, what does it enable you to do? I think it's making, it's not just me, I think the, uh, my senior management team have been with me for a long time on this journey. Um, you know, and quite a few of our people, our retention is incredibly high. Um, and I think what it did for us was, it was that next level, mm. you know, and I don't think people fully appreciate that. And I think even from an investor, when they're looking at you in terms of an IPO, and, you know, and I read the headlines and wanted to cry when I saw some of my headlines where it was, you know, founder makes 50 million on a share selling. You, amazing how many people said to me, are you buying a yacht? Mm -hmm. Are you doing this? And I'm like, actually, now I'm going back to work, right? Because I'm doing what I love doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think what we did, it, I went back with the, out of responsibility, 
and the maturity that comes with that too. And mm. you know, I'm 49 and I'm saying I've just grown up. This is frightening, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, seriously, I believe in the last 10 years I've grown up, but it's that responsibility that came, but we've all stepped up a level. And when we're looking for the talent and yeah. things like that, um, actually we're looking for people like us. Mm. This is not that hard. And, and, and does going through that affect your, does it boost your ability to attract brilliant people? Did you notice that or was it more of a sort of just more of the same? No, I think it, our profile is raised. Um, you know, we win awards. I have no idea about what they are. Sometimes I have to go and Google and look up things now and I'm learning. I feel like I'm on an everyday learning thing right now. Um, I think the media write about us. One, being a female CEO mm -hmm. is quite newsworthy, right? But equally, we're one of the largest British games publishers, yeah. which is something I never thought I'd be sat here saying. Right. And I was going to ask you about that because there are lots of clearly misconceptions about the industry. Mm. Let's be, let, we bust a couple of myths mm. on stage. I mean, sure. Because it's not all blokes that play games for a start. Oh, gosh, no. I mean, the scary fact is over 50% of the people who play, vid who play games are women. Right, that may frighten some of you. Now that a lot of you, I'm sure, have played Angry Birds, Candy Crush. Yeah. You know, how many of you have got girls who play Minecraft? You know, this should explain a lot of this. So, for starters, over 50% are female that play video games. Mm. Secondly, we don't just sit there all day playing games. Honestly, it's one of the ho most hardest working industries that I've ever known. And emotion and passions run high. You know, in a creative environment, sometimes. Dealing with staffing problems in a normal services business can be tough. You want to deal with them in a creative environment where passions are there. So, right. And yet you want to attract those passionate Absolutely. characters as well. Right. Questions uh, for Debbie. It could be an observation, something that's making you think about. Yeah, please, second to back row, and feel free to say who you are, but you don't have to. Shout Hi, out for I'm us. I'm Susie Wilde from Founding Studio Advisory. Um, we're just really hitting our scale. Sorry. So we're just really hitting our scale phase now, so we're looking at the next few years and kind of whether we're going to list, whether we're going to merge. Yeah. How do you keep it fun? Because I feel this responsibility <sighs> thing, huge responsibility, and we used to laugh. Our senior management team was, is static and invested, but is the fun, is keeping that fun in, instilled? Great question. It is a good question because, you know, when you do an IPO or whether you go into private equity funding, a lot of that fun goes. But it goes, <laughs> but it only goes during the process. And what you have to do, I did myself a list, right? I think on, when I did LDC, um, private equity, I really kept myself at arm's length. They only got to meet me twice. I let the finance operations team deal with it. You know, they probably would have paid more if they met me, and that's what they told me earlier. They would have done that. Um, but I always said I had a great playlist, right? And I had to explain to them why I love Swedish House Mafia, which they had no idea who they were, right? <laughs> but the reality is I needed an escape. You know, I've talked about living where I live. In the, I lived in the middle of a forest at that point. Nobody could get near me. So you have to learn. But IPO, I did a list, and I kept it with me at all times of just why I was doing this IPO. And none of it, and I have to say, at the IPO fundraise and at the LDC private equity fundraise, we didn't actually need money, right? Team 17 is quite a cash generative business. Um, and we didn't actually need that finance at that point. And I would also say, if you're in that position, it's one of the best times to raise finance because mm -hmm. you're stronger. So what was top of the list, Debbie? Well, at IPO. Mm. Um, On that list that you kept going oh, back to. Love, passion. This is why I'm doing this. I love my industry. The people who work for me, you know, I always say to people, just think about any industry. You're an engineer, a games programmer. You're a software engineer, right? You can earn way more money in banking than what you can make in video games. I see. So the list you're talking about is the list of why we're doing this, why we're doing Team 17 in the first place, not the reason we're IPOing. Yeah, isn't that yeah absolutely. But it's your personal reasons, yeah. right? Not the business reasons. This is your personal reasons. When we went to IPO, I was in a fortunate position. I'd already made enough money for what I wanted to do for my family and things like that. It became solely about why am I doing this? And it's the people in my company, why I was doing that for all those reasons, and I listed them. And every time it became annoying, and trust me, anybody who's been through commercial due diligence and an IPO, it, it soul destroy it, right? Seriously, it is soul destroy it. Um, you need to pull those things out and, and get yeah, a good The playlist. way you talk about it, Debbie, sounds like for you it was worth it. 
oh, I had fun, right? Um, and I mean, I never thought I'd say those two-week roadshows were fun. You know, I call it the school reports. For those of you who are listed, right, you get a feedback report from those, those and it's a bit like having your appraisals done a few times a year. <laughs> And I embrace my feedback reports. And so when I saw, if somebody had comments like, oh, I'm not sure about this, and it's a bit, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh my God, I went out my way to show them that, you know, the next time and, you know, make it fun and make it a bit of a game because it is quite a tedious process. So, 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 so well, first of all, any, any final questions? Because we're running out of time. Yes, oh dear, well, let's just take two really quickly and then Leanne will tell me off later. Good, one and two, yellow and orange, thank you. I think you're fascinating, Debbie, by the way. Congratulations on your success <laughs> you. so far. I'm a, I run a tech company called Active Digital. I've been selling mobile phones since I was 17, and I was one of only two 17-year-olds at well the done. time uh, that were female. Um, my question is, is there a game that you've developed that you're most proud of or something that's just really nostalgic, like you get on a train and the person next to you is playing your game? How does that make you feel? Uh, great question. Hold that thought, please, Debbie. Just pass just one back, and we'll just field the two, and then... We must move. Thank Hi, you. Hi, uh, Lucy Sharma Monday from Eagle Eye, uh, Hi. CFO there. Um, my question was really, uh, really interested to say, uh, hear you say that you put yourself uh, right out there and said, this is who I am and I believe in myself, yeah. which I thought was a really great opening uh, point. Um, going around the city all the time, it's a little bit like going back into the dark ages for me. Mm -hmm. um, very suited, very grey sometimes. <laughs> And I Hence just why I'm different, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I love. But I was interested in the reaction to you know you saying this is who I am and um, this is why this business is great, basically. Thank you. Okay, I think the first one on the gaming side, you know, it's a bit like asking if any of your children are better than the other. It's a real tough one. I've made over a hundred <laughs> games, right? And every one of them is my baby. Um, two, I have two worms, obviously, incredibly special. Um, but also the first one that I launched on my label in 2014 was called The Escapist. And very quickly, the guy who created The Escapist created it in his bedroom, uh, made it for peanuts. It sold many millions of units. Um, he went and bought his parents a house. They lived in a council house. He bought them their own house and been able to change lives. And that's what we're doing. We're not only are we creating multimillionaires here, which we are doing, we're actually changing people's lives, no matter how you view it. So that was that side. Regarding the city, do you know what? Honestly, I remember the, the week before I had to go out and do test marketing at IPO, I had advisors, 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 all telling me this and this and trying to script you up and all of that stuff, right? And I can remember going home from the office on the Friday and I was swearing a lot on the drive home because I can't be scripted up. It's impossible to script me up. And I remember Chris Bowman at Barenberg, who's been an absolute <coughs> angel for me. And I've known Chris for years, so he kind of knew what he was dealing with a little bit. And Chris phoned me up that night and said, I hear you had a rough day today. And I said, yeah. And I took him through. And I said, they're trying to script me up. I can't be scripted. Mm -hmm. And he turned around to me and he said, listen, I've seen you do what you do. And that's why everybody is going to want to invest in you. Do not change. Don't let anybody. Don't let anybody tell you what you need to do. And I think again that confidence thing and getting the reassurance from somebody who actually is very successful at doing what he does, you know, gave me the confidence to actually go. Do you know what? Who cares what these people are saying? I'm just going to go there, be who I am. I love my business. I believe it's a great business. They're either going to invest or they're not going to invest, and I can't control that. So let's just get over it. And I think that's what it gave me. That Debbie, helps. I hope you're conscious, I'm sure you are, of the effect that sharing your story has uh, on, on other people. I just want to say thank you. Um, oh, you're no running problem. this incredible company and you come to share your story today. So thank you. Very welcome. Thank cool. you. Debbie, thanks. Back. Great. Thank you. Great.